motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome to the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host. And today, my special guest is Erica Souter. The title of this episode is Whole, and there's a good reason why I wanted to talk to Erica about being whole. But before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about Erica. Now, the shorthand in introducing Erica is that she's an author, journalist, and parenting expert. I love that. I really love the fact that she's a parenting expert. So well, I'm sure we'll get into that. But she's more than 20 years of journalist experience, so journalism experience, and is a nationally recognized voice in parenting news and in parenting advice. She's a regular columnist on Good Morning America and other national broadcast outlets because it's her job to speak to parents across the country, America, to stay on top of the issues, controversies, and trends most affecting families today. Yes, just our kind of woman, eh? Now, her work appears on The Bump, What to Expect, Cafe Mom, and Mom.com, all high-traffic parenting sites that reach millions of mums each month. Her writing has also been featured in People Magazine, US Weekly, Essence, Cosmopolitan, Self and WebMD. Erica received her bachelor's degree from Georgetown University and a master's degree from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. But the reason I wanted to talk with Erica is because she has a fantastic book that I think sits beside noise perfectly. I'm going to let her tell us in a minute what that book's about. But trust me, it's perfect because don't we just want to be whole human beings, us mothers? And that's what we're going to be talking about. And maybe some of you already, like Danusha, I am. Of course you are. Of course you are. But how does the world treat you? So, Here then is my conversation with Erica Souter. Erica, welcome. Lovely to have you here. So excited to be here to talk to you. This is going to be a very fun conversation on moms. Yes, yes. Well, let's make it fun, shall we? I mean, (laughs) God, (laughs) motherhood is fun. I mean, it is many things, but it can be really fun, can't it? Uh, yes, it, it can be. <laughs> it can also be incredibly frustrating and hard. And I, I have to tell you, personally, nothing has made me more insecure at times than motherhood because, you know, no matter how much you read or how much you prep for being a parent, it's just nothing is like the actual experience of parenting, but not only parenting your child. I like to say I've had to parent myself as I've turned into this new person. Oh, I really love that. That idea of parenting yourself while you're attempting to, um, you know, kind of wing learning how to parent somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really, that's a lovely, that's a lovely way of putting it. It really is. Well, when I wrote Well, you know, when I decided to write this book, I wrote it because it was what I needed and didn't have when I was this new parent. And actually, it's still, I think, incredibly useful now that I have like a teenager and a four-year-old. A terrible spread, by the way. (laughs) Like they they fight like uh, Tom and Jerry, the cat and mouse. They they argue all the time. But um, (laughs) I... I, (laughs) Who I thought think, up that age gap? I, I don't know what I was thinking. I think I thought, well, you know what? He's eight and a half. This is easy. Let's do this again oh. so that oh, they can no. have each other to complain about when I'm old and cranky and annoying, but can at least, you know, commiserate with each other. 
But um, one of the things that struck me when I was a new mom was that um, the expectations of motherhood were so overwhelming, not just personal expectations, but what I felt the world expected me to be. And then it left no room for who I wanted to be in addition to being a mother. Because once you're a mom, it's like, that's your, that's supposed to be your primary identity and your most important identity. And yes, it is the most important thing you can do, but it doesn't have to be the only thing you can do. So I started this book writing how to have a kid in a life with the question of why does being a good mom mean giving up everything that made you, you? And I took it from there. And yeah, well, given that uh, this is what I wrote about in my book, you know, listeners that are regulars will be like, mm-hmm. yay, these two are going to get on well. <laughs> They're going to riff. <laughs> you know, so, you know, one of the chapters in my book, uh, Noise, uh, was it always called, uh, it's about, you know, motherhood is a calling, like this, mm-hmm. this busting this myth that, that motherhood is a calling and, and that it's the, it eclipses everything else. Like it, right. you know, once, once you become this, this mother that it just, you know, you kind of get subsumed under the umbrella of motherhood and, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, it's obvious. Do we need to say it that we love our children? Do we really need to say that, you know, we would run into the sea for them, et cetera, et cetera. Right. <laughs> but we feel but, this pressure to say it, right? Especially if we have any kind of complaint or anything that we're unhappy with in regards to motherhood, it's like, well, we have to qualify it. I'm still a great mom because I love my children. I would die for them, but I am solely dying inside and I need to do something else with my life as well. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And the idea of being a whole human being Mm -hmm. and, and also being a mother seems to be an anathema. Like it's, no, but maybe there's something a little bit wrong. I mean, you still do love them and do you? I, actually, I was on I was on Irish radio not long ago and I, I the editor personally, you know, because often it's researchers, as you know, mm-hmm. but a, a, the editor personally asked me uh, if I would have a, a short call with her. And she, she said, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm curious. This thing about like being yourself, but, and she is a mother, but being yourself, you know, and like... Um, kind of the idea of putting yourself first or or kind of being on the radar once you've got children, Mm -hmm. does that mean that they suffer? Like, are you really saying that you've got to put your children behind you? It's like, oh my goodness. One, 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 you haven't read the book. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Like, come on, come on. You haven't read the book, but, but that's, I didn't say it like that, but you know, it's like, no, 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 that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. Right. But actually, that's that isn't that like, what do you make of that, Erica? Well, you know, that's that's incredibly frustrating. And that's incredibly real, by the way, that that Mm. kind of thought process. And what I think what I want moms to understand is that if they are not fulfilled and happy in other areas of their life, they're probably not being the kind of parent or partner that they want to be. You know, you can't give a hundred percent of one hundred and fifty percent of yourself to your children and neglect your needs and wants and be the person that you want to be. You know, it's okay for you to want more. It doesn't mean that we're not loving our children, feeding our children, <laughs> going to their recitals and their games and being there to, you know, put a band on it on every boo-boo and talk to them and teach them things. But there is space in this life for taking care of our children and taking care of ourselves. And it's just the problem that our cultures have taught us that they don't exist together, but that's not true and it's not fair. And so that's why, I know that's why you wrote your book and it's why I wrote my book because I think I feel like sometimes mothers need permission to put themselves on the top of their to-do list. Yeah, exactly. And, and also, this isn't something that fathers seem to struggle with. Not at all. No one ever no. asks a dad when he goes back to work and he has two kids or, you know, oh, how are you going to handle your job responsibilities with two kids? Or no one ever questions their work ethic or their ability to produce. And I talked to so many mothers who, when they went back to work, they were faced with this 
perception that they weren't going to be as dedicated, that they weren't going to be as on top of their game, and then they weren't going to be as effective as team leaders or team members. And the fact is, research has shown that women who have children are better multitaskers, they're better leaders, they're, they're incredible in the workforce because they have this this life that has so many other aspects to it. They have to get things done. They have to be organized. They have to produce because mm. they know that they ha- there's, a, there's a life outside that office that they also have to take care of. So I just feel that, you know, we live in, you know, in our world says that it respects mothers and it's the most, you know, important, most reverential thing that you can do. But in so many areas, mothers are disrespected and disregarded. Yeah. And that's one, that was one of the things that I really wanted to bring home in this book was that, you know, these are the kinds of the things that you're going to face when you, when you're a mother, but this is also how you overcome them. And I thought that was real. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just wondering because I, I have the same uh, crazy age gap between children, just so you know. Mm-hmm, I know. And <laughs> yeah, so I have, I have very tiny age gap between some of my children, like 16 months, you know, or, or kind of four and five years or, and, mm-hmm. and then, and then I have longer ones. And, and my favorite one, which was also the crazy one, actually, is the, the kind of eight and a half, nine year gap, which is what you've got. And I, mm-hmm. I, I had to, I have. And I see differences in having children with gaps. We can see the differences of the kind of expectations that are placed on mothers in different Mm -hmm. kind of almost decades, can't we? Because things have changed. They are, I mean, our our access to the workforce for many women is, you know, is present, but has, have the intensive intense pressures on us as mothers really changed for the better or what do you think? What are you seeing? Well, you know, I think that, no, I think the the pressure hasn't changed for the better. I think it's still there. I think it's, and it's in a lot of, for a lot of women, it's magnified because of social media, because we often see (sighs) other mothers being perfect mothers, looking great, home looks great. They make these amazing cookies and cupcakes and breakfasts that we just, a lot of us don't have time to do or, or, or just aren't good at, you know, the present, the same kind of presentation. So it puts this pressure on us to be like, oh my gosh, you know, I remember making my son's Halloween costume one year and I stayed up all night, all night to make it. And in the morning he hated it. He was like, oh my God, this looks so bad. I'm not going to wear this to school. <laughs> and I was so I had I had literally slept two hours, and I was thinking like, oh my gosh, like I had followed this um, how to I had seen on social media, and it looked terrible. And I wound up going to buy him a ninja costume, and he was perfectly happy, which is what I should have done in the in the first place. But it just made me in that moment. I thought, my gosh, I spent the entire night doing this, and I failed, right? And these are tiny failures. In the grand scheme of life, they don't you know, he's, he's going to be a wonderful, successful person, even if my, the Minecraft costume I made him was crappy. But in that moment, it just makes you feel like, why can't I do this? Why can't I be this great crafty mom, but also be a super success at work and then also have this great marriage and then also have a social life? It's just, there's, there's so much pressure because we think everyone else is doing it, even though they're not. And even though we do, we do know that so pictures on social media are very highly stylized and edited. It doesn't take away from the pressure we want to be great at everything we do, especially as parents. So I do think that the pressure in general is is worse now than it probably was 30 years ago or 20 years, even just before social media existed, because we weren't watching everyone else look like they're doing it perfectly. Yeah, exactly. We're seeing the interior of people's lives, aren't we? The decisions we're inside. So not everybody's lives, but we enough of people's lives to have that picture so mm-hmm. that we can compare ourselves. It's comparison yeah. plus plus that competition both within ourselves to to turn up, show up as that, as perfect as mother as we can possibly be. Right. And really. I mean, yeah, I mean, the pressure is enormous. It is. And I I compare 
motherhood to like an Olympic sport, right? It actually could be an Olympic sport because everyone's vying for the gold, right? And if someone, yeah. what I found when I talked to a lot of moms and I talk a little about mommy judgment in the book and feeling judged with every mother mm. has felt judged at some point or the other, but of a course. lot of it comes from, you know, if you decide that you're only giving your child organic food, right? And then someone else doesn't, I, I, a lot of moms feel that they have to judge or put down that other parent's choice to make their choice more valid, right? Yeah. So it's this idea that like, well, if they're doing something that's opposite of what I'm doing, then I'm going to have to like knock it down or put it down to justify what I'm doing and, and make me feel as though I'm making the right choice. I think that there's no way to escape judgment, right? I, I have talk to researchers and social scientists and therapists and moms all across, across the United States and trying to figure out like, is there a way to like, just not judge each other? And it's not, it was too innate in human nature. We judge. And I think what we have to do is change how we consider judgment, right? If we go into yes. it knowing that someone's going to judge me and I'm probably going to judge as well, then it takes a little bit of the power away. And we can't look at it as something that diminishes our choices or what we are as parents. But we just have to look at it as like, well, that's what works for their family. That doesn't work for mine. And I'm okay with it. And I think we just have to be strong enough to do that. Otherwise, we're going to feel defeated all the time. So you have to do some internal work, right? You have yes. to like build up your steam as a person, a parent, and a woman so that when other people do something differently, it doesn't make you feel insecure or um, question what you're doing. Totally, I really agree because because it's it's inevitable as human beings that we're going to judge, we're going to compare. I love all this work around, you know, a raise comparison. How mm. it's as it's as innate as is as breathe. It's like it's like breathing. It's ridiculous. We're going. We have to benchmark ourselves somewhere, yeah. whether that's upwards, downwards, you, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. We're going to do it. And so the, the thing is whether we're going to get buffered around, you know, like thrown about by other people's journeys rather than great for her, yeah. not for me. Yeah. You know, it, it's like great for that family, we don't do it like that. Yes. Hey, but how how then have you personally found ways to kind of solidify that center of who you are as a woman and then as a mother? So, you know, I started motherhood with the same insecurities and worries and fears as everyone else. I remember... Mm. Um, <laughs> Going to uh, this yoga re retreat, it was like a, a, a gift uh, that my husband gave me. It was, you know, I had been a mother a year and, you know, breastfeeding was very hard for me. Like he, my, my firstborn never really latched well. It was just a painful, difficult thing. And mm -hmm. I remember being at this yoga retreat and this woman had breastfed till her child was uh, like four or five. And I just couldn't believe it. And I just, in my mind, I was like, and I asked her, I was like, well, I mean, he can choose steak. Like, are you breastfeeding? Like, <laughs> and, you know, and then I had to, I, and for the longest time, for, for years after I met this woman, I would think about that. That's crazy, right? Like, who would do that? And I, she did explain that she did it because it was like a soothing, it was a bonding thing, and it was really important for her. But I was very judgy about it. I was going to say, but you were really judgy, weren't you? That's the, yeah, that's the I was point. Totally judgy. I was like, that is insane. What like, a anyone weirdo. With, anyone with molars shouldn't be breastfeeding. To, you know, shouldn't, yes, um, yeah. So, but then I, you know, as time went on, and I and, and my work shifted toward writing about motherhood and talking to and being around mothers and being in this space, and it made me realize that my judgment of her had nothing to do with her. It had to do with the fact that I couldn't breastfeed well, right? I was a bad milk producer. I had a terrible time with it. And it came from my insecurity, right? Yeah. That I was terrible at this. I couldn't, I mean, I could barely get through three months. I couldn't imagine three years, right? So I, that's when I started to kind of evolve how I thought about other mothers, and what their choices were, because it just, it just took a lot of self-reflection, like, and, and also when you're judging, sometimes it takes up too much time, right? Cause I would just think about it like, oh, that's crazy. Like, why is she doing that? And anytime breastfeeding came up, I'd think about it and I'd mention it to someone else. I was like, that should not be 
right? This woman was able to do something miraculous with her body that I wasn't able to. Cheers to her. And so that's why I just have to start thinking about it. The same way when someone tells me that their kid has never had French fries. And I'm like, that's amazing. My kids eat French fries all the time. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yes. I'm like, you just, you have to develop this sense of like, no one has the formula for raising perfect children. Right. But and, I, I actually have to stop you, Erica. Yeah. Are you telling me that there really are people that don't give their children French fries? Are you actually trying to tell I me? Am, that I am telling you, I am telling you there are women that I've interviewed who have never given their kids a French fry that is fried in oil. Yes. <laughs> Baked French fries aren't quite the same. <laughs> But like, and, and, and what do they do? What do they do? I mean, we'll come back on to what you were talking about in a sec, <laughs> but what do they do when their children go off into the world without them? Like, and they are offered French fries, God forbid. Well, I mean, a lot of uh, what I've interviewed a lot of moms who have a very tight control over their kids' diets, right? So they send their lunches to school at birthday parties. They send the approved snacks that they can have. I mean, this is an, an extreme. I think a lot of us are just way too tired and way too overworked to to micromanage in in that way at a birthday party. But I have. I've been I've been at birthday parties myself with my with um, my children, and the kid opens up their own snacks, like they're not can't have the chips or the Doritos or whatever, you know, salty, highly processed snack there is at the party. And then they're eating their homemade kale chips or, or what have, what have you. <laughs> and I think like, you know, it's, excuse it's me, that, Mal, I wet myself <laughs> laughing. <laughs> and I'm like, if you have the time for that, more power to you. Like, I Fabulous. think that's amazing. Right. I don't, don't judge me for not being that person. I remember talking to one mom who she was in this mom group that met in the park every weekend. And she was a, she's a busy working mom and she just didn't have time to make all of her own baby food. So what she would do is she'd go buy the grocery for store baby food, but then put it in her containers from home and pretend when she's at the park with her friends that they were, she was giving um, her baby homemade food. And I thought, my God, like if, if you have to pretend with these people, are they really your people? Is this, is this your mom tribe? Are these, are these your people? If you have to pretend that you can't be honest about being so tired, so overworked, so stressed that you don't have time to make a whole menu of baby food for every day of the week. You know, so I really kind of um, push moms to not just give themselves space and time for the things that they love, but also be mindful of who they surround themselves with, right? So everyone's mom tribe will look different. But yours has to resonate with you. They have you have to feel supported. You have to feel um, boosted and lifted up by the people that you're with because you know it's really important, right? Our friends and our family and the people we surround our, ourselves with feed our soul in a lot of ways. They they these should be happy times. This shouldn't be us trying to hide who we are, especially when it's something like baby food. It's about baby food. You should mm. be who you want and need to be around the people that you spend time with. And so I have, I have an entire chapter on, you know, it's not just about finding mommy friends. It's about finding the right kinds of friends. And here are the questions you need to ask yourself um, when you're with these people, you know, yeah, do you feel do good you, about yourself? Can you exactly. share? Can you be vulnerable? That's a big mm. thing. Like, can you, you tell have, the truth? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can you, can you say, like, talk about the argument you just had with your spouse or that your kid in, in, needs special services or um, that you're suffering from depression? You, you, it doesn't help us to be around people that we can't be ourselves. You know, we. Yeah, do. yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, for, for many mothers, can, can you say that maybe this thing called motherhood isn't exactly what you thought it would be cracked up to be? That you yeah. were sold a crock? That you yes. were, you know, that you love your child, yes, but the experience of the the process of mothering and the all the the, the trials and the challenges mm -hmm. that the world gives you, what I call the mother stopping culture, is like it, it's a pain in the ass. It's <laughs> it's not what we thought it would be. Yeah. So many of all we were sold. I mean, the yeah. pictures. Don't do this lugging up a stroller or a buggy up 50 steps you know, because, <laughs> because there's no way to get you know onto some train or something because no one's thought about it and yeah. you know all just practical 
challenging, tiring aspects of motherhood as well as the emotional stuff later. But, you know, all of all of that can just mount up. And yeah, we kind of sold this idea of it being really beautiful and and pretty and yeah yeah every tv show every movie even when you you know uh celeb interviews and i talk about that in the book as well i used to cover um i used to be a writer for an entertainment magazine and i covered celebrity mothers and it was always like i'm back in my skinny jeans and you know, a month after giving birth, and I love every minute of motherhood, and I loved being pregnant, and and I'm, you know, and when I became a mother, I was I'm like, going oh to my. vomit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, and it's so there's there's so much out in the world that tells us that this is what motherhood looks like, and if it doesn't look and feel that way for you, you feel like a bad person. And the truth mm-hmm. of the matter is, there are more people struggling with the transition to motherhood than who find it an easy thing to, you know to go, go into. So I wanted to write about that. Like it is normal to struggle. It's normal to struggle with be, you know, who you are now versus who you were before to not, um, have been fully aware of the, what to expect. You know, I yes. start each chapter with, you know, there's a title and then it's like what to really expect under is as the subhead. And it's like, you know, yes, your marriage is going to change your friendships with women who aren't mothers will change. Absolutely. Uh, Your career will change, but it doesn't have to be mean, like these are all terrible. These are all terrible things. Like I I wanted to give practical, practical advice about how to cultivate those relationships or those things that you still love and you still need in your life while also being a parent, because parenthood doesn't have to be the only thing you do. It can, you know, it doesn't have to be your only focus. You deserve some of that focus as well. Oh, completely. Uh, absolutely. I was, you're reminding me that one of the funny things about uh, motherhood is this whole notion that we're all going to be incredibly weighed down by guilt. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, one of the, one of the uh, myths that I append is, is that, and <laughs> what makes me laugh is, you know, I, I mean, I could cry about it, but it, it, I'll choose to laugh, is that women who don't feel guilty And there are lots of women who don't feel guilty about Mm -hmm. anything in motherhood. They they feel guilty that they don't feel guilty. And so they end up feeling, my research showed that they they don't actually feel guilty about motherhood in the least bit, but they just feel guilty that they don't belong to the guilt club because, you know, it's such a strong narrative that you will feel guilty about. Anything and everything, whether you are there mm-hmm. at the per- parents' meetings, if you if you're not there, if you're you know, actually right. the message that mothers are given beyond the kind of oh you can breeze in and look glorious, you know, glam and all that <laughs> stuff, and your baby is going to be so fabulous, um, and it's all going to be great. Um, it is I think I've lost my train of thought, which I don't often do, but I have. <laughs> I was <laughs> saying like God, this- I'm human <laughs> i know right um the idea that um if we're not wrapped with guilt when we don't measure up to this perfect mom image that's that's another pressure right this idea that like yeah. for, for those who don't feel bad about missing the, the parent teacher conference or the little league game or or not being there for every school event what's wrong with her like why you know, if she's just not motherly, that's, that's, that's another thing. I talk, actually, I write about this thing called the mom gene, which is an actual gene that science scientists have found Yes, and in mice. And then they, they believe that women have the, the same gene and it, and it will, it's like, it's possibly an indicator of how maternal you are or you're longing for children. And I wrote about that because I have always felt I never had the mom gene. Like I've never longed for children. It was my husband who kept telling me my biological clock is ticking. We have to have children. I want to be a dad. Like it's the most important thing in the world to me. And then I kind of was like, okay, well let's do this. And I always wondered like why I never longed <laughs> to have kids when so many women around me seem to. So I wrote about that. Like what happens if you don't have those, you know, those 
those what you what we think are should be the typical response to the idea yeah, of motherhood the baby yearning yeah the baby yearning and you know does that you know what that how that makes you feel and this idea that you as soon as you have a baby these motherhood these mothering instincts will kick in and you'll know how to discern the cries and how to clear up cradle cap or colic or all these things and i was like you know what happens if you're flailing and you feel completely underwater in the beginning and and but you you feel like you're not supposed to feel this way what how does that that's not a good state of being for moms being where they feel like okay i'm really failing because i'm supposed to have all these natural instincts and none of them are working i'm a terrible mother i'm a terrible person I'm a terrible woman and i wanted to kind of eradicate that like i don't believe that you know it's innate for all of us like for a lot of us those in those things have to be learned like love is innate i think parenting is not I mean, that's really, I feel that you learn how to parent along the way. And every child you have will need a different kind of parent. Like my two children, I, I mean, I can't even believe they're from the same gene pool. They're so different. <laughs> and they both require a different kind of mom. And I feel yeah. like that's something that I'm okay with, right? It's like, I don't, I, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I figure it out as I go along, but that is not how it's supposed to be. That's at least that's how we're, we're told that's not how it's supposed to be, that we're supposed to kind of intuit a lot about mothering. Yeah, I, the idea that we'll all have that that maternal instinct is and, and know instantly how to, you know, do all these practices or, you know, yeah. just know how to parent is totally ludicrous. It, it really is. is. And for, I'm so glad that, you know, yourself and other writers are demystifying this whole idea of this this groundswell of love that comes. For some women, that is the case. For some mothers, yeah. that is the case. You know, it, we know that. And, and in fact, you know, dare I say, for the same woman with different children, <laughs> you know, because we're not allowed to say this. We're really not allowed to mention that, that you know, apparently that... that when you give birth to one child, you won't, baby, you won't necessarily feel the same way with another. Mm -hmm. It can be very different, different labors, different yeah. things, you know, diff different chemical connection, if you yes. like, if I can put it that way. And I thought it was a really interesting piece of uh, research that I, I um, did when I was writing Noise. And it's in relation to the mom gene. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a distinct difference between the way that white women talk about having getting pregnant, and um, white women talk about having a baby. If if you ask them, you know, about getting pregnant, they're like, "I just want to have a baby." Mm -hmm. And the research <laughs> that I did really showed that. You know, from different ethnic groups, actually, but non-white, were raising a child. So there was a cultural, what they talked about was raising a child. And oh, do you know, Erica, I found this so interesting because this pr kind of prominent focus, especially for white women, mm -hmm. on having a baby, having the, the nursery, the, mm. the, the clothes, the, the the maternity wear, the you know, and I know that not all women are like this, mm -hmm. but there is a there is a strong aesthetic to it, you know, with yeah. the baby, right? you know, having a baby. But babies are very transitory, you know. It's mm -hmm. like they're not a baby for very long, <laughs> you know. They soon become a stinky, you know, child, a toddler, right. a, you know, a, a messy messy child and I thought it was a really interesting distinction I, enjo I enjoyed finding that well I, I, it's really interesting because I do think you know certain cultures the idea mm. of that whole idea of a village is really yes. a part a collective of yes part. a collective mm -hmm. like you raise mm -hmm. your children together the child's not just yours it's it's everyone yes. so my husband my husband's family is very much like that they're Cuban and mm -hmm. um, they, you know, on his street, even that he grew up on, he had, you know, four of the houses he was surrounded by were relatives. And yes. it was everyone could um, discipline each other's children. Everyone could feed each other's children. You know, it was just this idea that if this child was at your house, 
he's right along with your other children, right? And yeah, I it's think, a community endeavor. Yes. And I think we don't do that anymore because no. for a lot of us, we're growing up a, away from the communities we were raised in, right? Yes. We moved away for work or for school or for whatever. And we just didn't go back to the communities we were raised in. And so I, I, I call them in my book, these um, familial deserts, right? Yeah. Kind of like food deserts in urban areas where there aren't grocery stores where you can get nourishing food. Well, I think a lot of people are raising their kids where they're not being nourished by those family members that could help, not just with babysitting, but with giving you advice or just feeling supported or feeling that you're not alone. So mm. I think what has happened is that, and for a lot of people, the focus now becomes of the fun part of parenting, right? Like, what is what color is my nursery? What about my registry? What kind of car seat am I going to get, right? And like you said, those things are just a blip in your parenting journey, like, right, a blip. There are so many other things that that it means or it includes that we don't think about because we're so focused on that initial kind of superficial um, aspect of parenting. Yeah, and, and the kind of support that that's often offered is for the first few months, the first year. Mm -hmm. And actually the really tough part, and it is a tough part, that first year is an incredible, uh, you know, upward curve of learning. And, yeah. and, and certainly with subsequent children, it's, yes, you might have successfully, you know, hopefully got through, but, but the fact is, Nevertheless, it's another different child. So it's not going to be a, you know, replication of the last journey. Right. But actually, when you get to slightly older, it becomes a different type of parent challenge. And, and yeah. each stage brings something different. And I think there's, there's this, oh, I mean, talking about the, the isolation of that desert, the familial desert, but actually the support desert, there's it all just falls away, falls yeah. away. And, and having, you know, raised quite a lot of teenagers, I mean, that is a period where the isolation is, is profoundly stark mm. because there are, there are very few groups or places to go where you can say that beautiful toddler that, you know, was gorgeous in those photos has turned into a wild person, yes. <laughs> you know, and that person right. has now, is now the attacker, is now the, the, you know, unwieldy, unruly, don't know what to do. And it used to have organic, you know, like kale chips at that party yeah. in that pretty little dress. <laughs> and now look, it's, it's got a nipple ring. Yeah. Age yeah. 14. You're, you're, you're right. You're, oh, my God. Oh, my, I'm terrified. I mean, I'm really terrified. Okay, I won't say yeah, any more right. because you will get more terrified. <laughs> I know. But, yes, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Because the support is, I, I, you're right, the group support, the finding the new moms to commiserate with or talk to or befriend is different and, and probably a lot easier in those early stages but then as a teen it's you're kind of wondering like where do you find that kind of support when you're dealing with in a wild teen who won't listen yes yes and, yeah. and it's I presume I, I think that people would assume that you know if you met people when you had babies you'd all continue in your friendship group but we've just said mm -hmm mobility, social mobility, work mobility means that we don't stay in the same place. We go move we somewhere. We go to a new city, go to a new country. Right. And so we don't have that deep connection of, oh, you remember those baby classes you went to and now we're on the third child or whatever it is. No, no, we enter a new, a new social group and we take our teens with us and they are not as, right. they are not as um, compelling and attractive <laughs> when, when they're going through <laughs> what they clearly need to go through to, to become larger human beings, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They're just not to, and it, and a lot of it is, a lot of it falls to the mother uh, to manage the, you know, navigate the emotional terrain of it all. And so it, it, right. it becomes a different kind of journey. 
and very, very isolating, potentially. So yeah. it's something for, it's something for, actually, we, we need to be thinking how we support parents in this far more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the things like it, it, it takes a little work to maintain those connections as your kids yes. get older, because there's some natural, so they're not having class together. They're not having, your kids aren't having the same play group or dance recital or a little league team. So then it becomes more of an effort. You know, I have, so I, I'm parenting in two groups, right? I have a four, a four and a half year old and I have uh, the 13 year old. And as my friends that I made with the 13 year old, we have had to make more of a concerted effort yes. to find time to connect and be together or hang out because our kids have kind of all splintered and they're going in New York. You know, I live in New York city and um, oftentimes they all go to different high schools, yes, right? You apply exactly. to high school and they could be scattered all over. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done was like, okay, you know, once a week we're meeting for coffee, once a month, we're going to have a dinner. And then we also text each other constantly to bring up, things and issues that we might be dealing with, right? So it's an, it's more of an effort to stay connected, but we have to because it's, it's for my sanity as much as it is for <laughs> anything else. Yeah. Like I need them. Yes. And so I think I, I also want to encourage moms to make that effort, right? It's not always going to be like, oh, I'm going to see her when I drop off at school. So then we'll, we'll talk then. Sometimes you're going to have to send that text and be like, hey, what's going on? What are you up? Yes. And just make an effort to stay connected because you need that. Like you really do need those connections for, I think, for your whole life. I, I'm not even just during motherhood because eventually your kids are going to leave and then what you really want to have something to do <laughs> yeah no it, exactly in fact I just texted a uh, a friend this morning to say I'm coming to stay <laughs> I'm driving <laughs> two hours I'm going to put the triplets in the car and I'm 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 coming I didn't actually to say to stay I said I'm coming I'm coming to your city mm -hmm. and I will look for somewhere to stay because it's too much in one day to do it with I have children with additional needs as well. So I'm like, no, I'll, I'll stay in the city because I, I just need to come. And of course, the subtext in there is <laughs> she's texted me back. Are you OK? Because she yeah. knows I wouldn't <laughs> normally do that. And sure enough, of course, I'm OK. Of course, I am. And actually, I need to do this because it's what you've said. I need to do this for my own sanity. I need a cup of tea right. and a good chin wag about life. And it's yeah. not the same on a Zoom. It's not the same mm -hmm. on texts. It's, I need to go do this. You know, I just do. Yeah. So it does take more effort for sure. And also our children, as they get older, they I know it's a very strange concept, but they have minds of their own, don't they? And, uh, and so, yes, oh, unfortunately. goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and so they go off people, you know, they people that they went to nursery or, you know, whatever they, they've known for years, they might not keep that strong kind of tight relationship because, well, they might not. So yeah. if you want to keep it with the parents, you know, you're going to – Mothers have to keep that going for themselves, yes, yes. you know. Yeah. And one of the things I actually um, write about is that you can't, don't base all of your friendships on whether your kids oh, stay no. friends. They might argue. Like, <laughs> they might argue. They might. <laughs> and I think going into that, right? So if there's a mom that you really love and like, um, and, you know, your kids don't stay friends, still make an effort to be, you know, be with that person or be that person's friend or confidant mm -hmm. because I found that so many moms were like, well, when their kids stop being besties with this kid, then their friendship with that mother fell apart. And that's something that they regret. And that happened more often than I, than I thought it would. So really your friendships should not be contingent upon whether your children are best friends. Yeah. You need to form bonds that are based on your sharing with, each other and being vulnerable and being supportive and having fun together. And, and that's, you know, and that kind of friendship is going to serve you a lot longer than, you know, for the time your kids are in little league together. Yeah. Well, quite a lot of mothers end up facilitating their children's friendships and, mm -hmm. and 
actually become friends with people that they probably wouldn't be friends with, but because the children yeah. like them, they do. And then, of course, when they get a little bit older, they fall out. So, yeah. it, you know, it, it's it's really important to find people that you get on with. And so that yes. speaks to that that chapter of yours about finding your tribe, your mum tribe, yeah. because that they'll, they're the ones that are going to take you through you know, illnesses and potential divorces and, you know, they're the ones in the middle of the night that will, yeah. if if you're lucky to have them. And then those of us that move around or have moved around don't have that, quite that tight group that all know each other, but we have pockets of it. We have, you know, yeah. a few women that, that we've known for ages or Sometimes I, I recently met an amazing woman and we've known each other months, but she's, you know, it, it doesn't matter. We've gone straight in, like really great mum friends. And and so it doesn't always have to be on longevity of relationship, does it? It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's more about connection. So it is. Yeah, it, it really is. It's, and your friends don't all have to be friends with each other. That's another thing that I find a lot of women, they want, they want this big group where they can all hang out. And I'm like, well... That's not, you, that means you're discounting someone who could be a wonderful friend, a wonderful support, someone you have fun with, who isn't a part of that big group. Your friends don't all have to be besties. <laughs> no, and, and it, can, it, can be, it can be awkward. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, mm-hmm. it can take a lot of time and energy to manage that besties group. So, you know, everything we've talked about, that we've talked about can actually be kind of embedded in that, that bestie group it, the comparison the competition the you know all of that can live in there and make life really quite awkward so and it can be brilliant too so it's really about it's really about finding what works for you isn't it it really is and and being okay with some trial and error yes <laughs> yes you know and, and being and- okay with making mistakes and and screwing up a bit yeah. And everyone does it. And just know that you're not alone. If you're feeling like lonely and awkward and don't know how to like spark a friendship, I promise you there are hundreds of thousands of other moms who feel the exact same, millions actually, who have the exact same thing. Yes. So you're never alone in your struggle. You just you kind of have to put yourself out there to kind of, to, to find those connections that are really going to be important to you, but also just take time for yourself and take time. If it's, you want to start a hobby, you want to start a new job, you want to join charities or foundations or learn a new skill or go back to school. All those things are worth your effort. Totally. Because they're going to make you happy and they're going to make you feel more whole. Couldn't agree more. Knew we'd get along. (laughs) Knew we would. When I come to New York, I'm going to look you up, Erica. (laughs) Yes, please. Oh, my gosh. I really will. I I would love that. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. And uh, the um, link to your book will be in the show notes. And, uh, yeah, great book. Come, I can't wait to read it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. It was brilliant. I really loved the way that Erica talked about finding our mum tribe and how that's so important for us as mothers and as women. And to also really, really concentrate on keeping whole, like not carving ourselves up into bits like the mum piece, taking over everything. It's like, no, we need a life of our own, no matter what that is. You know, what I really love about the conversation also is that we didn't talk hardly at all about working. It's like there's always this assumption that it'll, it's either the kids or work. And that's not what we talked about at all. So that was really great. One of my other kind of highlights of this conversation was when Erica talked about there's no way to escape judgments. You know, our judgments of other people, other mothers, and other people's judgments about us as people, about our parenting, our mothering, our children, ourselves. 
there's no way to control it. It's there, it's innate to human nature. So it's like, do you know what? Just accept it, surrender to that and find the way that suits you, your ways, your kids. Do that. Yeah, you do you. Yeah, really refreshing. There's so much more that I could <laughs> I could say I loved. But thank you, Erica, for being on the show today and really imparting your wisdom. You can find uh, Erica's book, How to Have a Kid and a Life in All the Places That You'd Imagine, obviously. And I hope you enjoy it. I mean, it would be a great companion for Noise, a manifesto in modernizing motherhood. There is no doubt one's about my book is about the identity of women once they become mothers and upending the myths and how to be with the mother stopper culture as i call it and i know i'm going to get my copy of erica's book very soon but i know that erica's book will be a tremendous companion so you know i hope you get get her book i really do so next week, I have another guest uh, on the show, and I hope you'll join me. I really do. Until then, take really good care of yourselves. I'm sending you huge amounts of love. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 